This is a picture of uh, my house. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, next to the E in we, that little square there is my house in Montana, which is in North America, way up near the Canadian border. And um, those trees that you see that look red, those are all dead trees. In 2005, we found a couple of dead trees from bark beetles. 2006, there were a couple of dozen dead trees. 2007, there were a couple of hundred dead trees. 2008, all of the trees on our property were dead. Um, talking about thousands of trees, 15 acres of property. We had them all cut down and shipped to a pulp mill and turned into pulp for cardboard. And we now live, except for a few trees around our house that we've sprayed, we now live in the prairie. You can't, you can see that, it's hard to see, but the mountains all behind us, all those trees are pretty much dead. The trees all around this part of Montana, many of them, lodgepole pine, ponderosa pine, are dead. Colorado, Wyoming, trees have been dying in, by the millions in the last 10 years or so. The reason they're dying is because of climate change. It's gotten two degrees warmer average in the West in the last 50 years. But the coldest it gets in the winter time is 15 to 20 degrees warmer than it used to be 50 years ago. And so instead of 30 below Fahrenheit in the winter time, it's zero or 10 below at the most. And so these bugs are living through the, the winter time. It was shocked to have all the trees die. And some of these trees are 200 or 300 years old. So as a journalist, I started to process this, and how you process this is write about it. A lot of the stories I've written about trees and forests are on the website at the New York Times, and you can go there and read them. I wrote about my own house, but I wrote about other places as well where trees are dying. This is a bristlecone pine. These are my kids. They went with me to see bristlecone pines in um, Nevada couple of years ago. Bristlecone pines are the oldest tree in the world. The oldest is Methuselah. It's in California. It's between four and 5,000 years old, almost 5,000 years old. These trees have learned how to survive by adapting to very extreme environments at the top of the mountains. What the problem is, is that it's no longer extreme at the top of the mountains. And so the beetles are invading this habitat at 11,000, 12,000 feet as well. But there's an, um, a fungal disease that's from, that came from Asia via Europe in 1900 that's also found the bristle cones because it's warmer at the top of the mountains. So these trees, the oldest trees in the world, are all going to die in the next 10 to 20 years. This for me was a seminal moment when I learned about the bristle cones because these things are all about adaptation in extreme environments and, and their world is changing and we're going to lose these trees without knowing very much about them at all. It was a sobering, sobering moment. So the question is, why should we care? Why should we care that trees might be dying? It turns out, every scientist I talk to, when I ask key questions about trees and their dying and their importance, said, I don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know about trees. It turns out that trees have been poorly studied. And it's kind of amazing to me. You can look out the window and see a tree, and almost, almost nothing is known about that tree because they simply have not been considered that important. They understand timber production. They understand some other key things. but a lot of what, a lot of things about trees are simply not known. But what we do know is they're going to be critical. They're, they're critical ecological infrastructure for the planet in a lot of different ways, for us and for other living creatures. First thing, of course, as it gets warmer, six degrees warmer over the next century, they're going to be critical as a heat shield. You want to live in a city that has a lot of trees or you want to live in a city that has no trees because the urban heat islands of cities are going to be very warm without something to keep the sun from burning down onto the asphalt and concrete in cities. 
a lot of cities in the U.S., and I presume other cities in the world, are, have million tree campaigns to add trees, to add to the urban canopy, which is, I think, going to be really important. They also block ultraviolet rays. They prevent cancer. Uh, reduction is, it varies but from tree to tree, but they're critical in terms of shielding us from ultraviolet rays. Trees purify water. There's a microbial root zone around the roots, densely packed microbes about as big as your finger. And these trees, when they take in water, these microbes, in exchange for sugars that come from the tree, they clean that water. And of course, it goes into the tree and into the atmosphere. And so trees, these microbes, not only clean the water for the trees, they clean the water for us. Some Winnie spoke yesterday about the um, forest of, of New York that was left intact in order to clean water for New York City. It's a critical function that trees play. In fact, that, that action is so robust that they use willows and aspen, aspen trees in phytoremediation, which is going to toxic waste sites, planting willow and aspen trees and cleaning up everything from TNT to um, dry cleaning solvents, even some radioactive uh, materials. Trees can clean that up. Uh, it's an astounding fact. You, you realize trees are filtering everything that goes through our system. They can clean up endocrine disruptors, which are those little things that are, are um, likely can't carcinogens in our system. Trees, there's huge problems with dead zones in the ocean because of fertilizer runoff. You can't treat all that water that runs off of farm fields. So you have to farm your way out of it by using trees. It's not being done yet, but it's one way that trees could be used to clean the planet's water. Lots of ways that we know, these are things we know about trees, they're just not being used this way. Trees are being used in Africa to reclaim desertified land. Millions of acres, millions of hectares of land have been reclaimed by allowing trees to grow, to take nitrogen, to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere in their leaves, to drop those leaves onto the ground and become a fertilizer. There's the World Agroforestry Center in Kenya that is using this technique to reclaim millions of acres of desertified land in Africa. Trees filter the air that we breathe. There's been a study that was done in New York, an innovative study by Columbia University that showed that admission, uh, admissions to emergency rooms for asthma attacks were much less in places where there was a leafy tree canopy. So in other words, they filter the, the particulates that cause asthma out of the air, and it's a healthier environment. Trees prevent flooding. They, they take water, they keep it from running off. Um, the, the Philippines had the floods that uh, we talked about yesterday. One of the reasons is because of deforestation. One of the reasons for the flooding of the Mississippi River in the U.S. is because of deforestation. 90% of the emergencies in the U.S. are because of flooding. And part of that is because of we've deforested much of our country. The problem is, as I, as I said earlier, um, there are a lot of things we don't know about trees, and there are little things known here and there. I'm going to talk about those and talk about what we don't know. I guess the, the key question here is, is, you know, why don't we know these things, and, and what are the ways that trees can kind of be, become part of an eco-technology to reclaim the future and to make sure that they survive? One of the key things for me are the aerosols that trees emit. One of the key aerosols is isoprene, which also became rubber. But in the, in the um, boreal forest, um, that same emissions may cool, help cool the planet in the summer because the trees, when it's warmer, emit more isoprene, which blocks the sunlight. 
and so that may cool the planet. And in the wintertime, there's less isoprene, so it allows more sunlight through. This is one of the things we don't know. There's speculation. Some scientists have studied this. I interviewed a lot of, a lot of scientists for my book, The Man Who Planted Trees, and again, they just all shook their heads about, well, here's what we think we know, but we're not really sure. But this is one of those areas, these aerosols. But another key uh, aerosol role is in willow trees. Uh, there are a lot of medicinal compounds that come from trees. We've all, all heard probably about Taxol, which is a treatment for breast cancer. It came from the yew tree. It also, trees also aerosolize this same compound. But one of the, I think, most important aerosols might be acetylsalicylic acid, which is where aspirin came from. Willow trees, there's three to 400 species of willows around the world emitting this compound and taking water through its system and treating this water, in essence, with this compound, which is shown to prevent several different kinds of cancer in very good clinical studies, shown to prevent heart attacks, shown to prevent strokes. And those are the things they've looked at. So as this water is absorbed through these willow trees, it's being treated by this compound. The question is, and this has not been studied, is does this somehow have an impact on the fish that live in the streams? Does it have an impact on the wildlife that drink the water? And does it have an impact on us? Is this a way, nature's way of maintaining health in the biosphere is through this disinfectant, through these chemo preventatives? But there's a whole range of things from peril alcohol to limonene, uh, methyl jasminate. These are all compounds shown to be effective anti-cancer agents, disinfectants, antibiotics, antifungals. But it is not a very well studied area at all. Willow trees are also being used, as I mentioned earlier, to clean up waste. They're in Sweden, there is a village I can't pronounce, that uses a willow to treat all of their sewage. They have a big willow farm, they put their sewage there, it takes up the, the sewage, processes it, cleans it through phytoremediation, and they harvest the willow trees, chip them, and use them for biofuel to, in their electrical plant. This is also wildlife habitat. This willow farm is also, uh, can be used to grow food around the edges. So again, there's innovative approaches taking place, with use of trees and understanding these eco-functions. I mentioned on the last slide, talked about um, uh, forests are the lover of the seas, and I uh, talk about these compounds that come out of trees. The campaign in Japan won an award from the UN, uh, Japanese man whose name also I can't pronounce, but uh, his... Um, uh, they found that humic acid from the decomposition of trees stimulates the growth of plankton. There's a chemical that allows plankton to fix iron, and it, it greatly stimulates their growth. So he led oyster fishermen and other fishermen in a campaign around Japan to plant trees all along the coast. And they've seen the fish stocks come back as these trees decompose and start to stimulate the growth of this plankton. It's called Forests Are the Lovers of the Sea, the name of the campaign. It's been highly regarded in Japan and other places for uh, innovate, innovation and the way it can help us reclaim what's happening uh, to the world. I mentioned the compounds that are aerosolized. Um, there's a fella who's done research in Chile on a tree called the Ulmo tree. He's found a compound in the stem of the tree, in between the cells, a fungal compound that he's using to grow diesel fuel. This is another thing that trees can do. They have novel fungals inside a lot of trees that have grown in the same place for a long time. And he's found that some of these have antibiotic properties. And, and one that he's experimenting with in Montana, he's found um, can be used to grow diesel fuel. It's experimental at this point, but I saw a bottle of diesel fuel that he has on his desk that he's used uh, to grow from this fungus that he's found in trees. Trees and forests have a healing effect. There's been studies in Chicago, inner city Chicago, that a landscaped environment can reduce um, anxiety, it can reduce depression, it can uh, increase impulse control amongst inner city people. Just having access to a landscaped environment versus an urban environment without landscaping. The big study in Norway that showed that people who live within a quarter mile of a park, they call it the green halo, also have similar kind of 
uh, positive health impacts. And then there's a precipitation cycle, which is something else we don't understand very well. The role that trees play in creating rain. It's, it's a very big role. There's several different ways that these things work. They've done studies in Africa to show that deforestation for plantations can reduce rain by 50%. 50 uh, there's a protein in a lot of trees that grow on the leaves that aerosolize into the atmosphere that create rain. This is unknown. This is all science that is kind of just getting started poorly known, but it's one of these, these things we need to understand as the, as the climate gets warmer and we can harness some of these effects of trees to make life easier for, for everyone. But trees and forests do the things that we know which are very important, from shade to fruit to nuts, uh, building our houses. But they also do a lot of things that we don't know. And in the end, they self-replicate. They do all of this and they self-replicate and you couldn't design a technology that, that did as many things or help human beings as much as they do. So we need to reframe, and I think that's the, the goal of my book and my talk, is reframe the, thing, the way we think about trees and to use them and understand them to kind of help us get through the, the next 100 years or so, and I think that they're really important for that. Thank you.